Okay. Great. So with that out of the way, let's start with the review. So um, so again, the the sort of main main driving force behind everything is that we're going to be talking about is Faraday's law. So Faraday's law states the following. Um, suppose you have a loop C in space. Uh, like that and say it's oriented this way. This is just some uh, some loop. And then you have some, uh, this loop is potentially moving through space and so on. And there are some potentially time varying electric and magnetic fields. Then if I have a charge Q on this loop, this charge Q will feel a force F And this is due to, to all the fields. Okay. So I have some, again, so I have some loop in space and it's potentially moving through space and the fields are potentially varying through time. And the whole setup is causing a force F to P on some charge Q, which is on this loop. Then um, we can actually, then what we can say is that uh, the line integral of the force is uh, equal to negative d phi dt. Now, let me just clarify something about this force. Uh, obviously, the electric field force is simple. It's just q times e. But um, for the magnetic field force, it's not exactly clear what I mean by that, right? So what I mean by the magnetic field force is you just imagine that um, the charge Q is on the loop and then the charge Q's velocity is whatever the velocity of that point in the loop is. So potentially, like I said, the loop is moving through space. So the implicit velocity of the charge Q is what the velocity of the loop is at that point. Anyway, so then the integral of this entire force, the line integral of this entire force about the loop is actually negative the um, derivative of the magnetic flux. And here phi, if I sort of call the surface um, S, then phi is the integral of um, the magnetic field through the surface. So this is what Faraday's law states in general. And then um, sort of practically what this means is that, that um, if this loop was in fact a, a conducting wire, then and it had some resistance, then a changing flux of magnetic field would cause a current to flow through this um, through this loop if it was a conducting wire. Okay, but this is a bit abstract right now. So um, we'll, we'll go into a couple of two very important cases of Faraday's law and talk about discuss those a little bit. But before that, let's just uh, quickly discuss the um, discuss the negative sign found here in Faraday's law. So essentially, what that means is that uh, let me actually go ahead and do one thing here. Let me. Um, let me orient this clockwise, counterclockwise. Okay, so uh, what I mean, what the what the negative means, is that uh, if you sort of, what it means is that there's a sort of direction. Yeah, so so I, I think the best way to explain what the negative sign means is that um, you sort of take your loop C, and if your loop C is oriented counterclockwise, and you're going to be computing the line integral in that counterclockwise direction, then you should compute the flux with um, with this direction positive for flux. So when you compute the flux, like if the magnetic field B is pointing out of the page, then it should be considered to be positive, B dot DA. If it's pointing into the page, it should be considered negative. And like I said, like, like with, with the surface, there's always two directions to orient the flux. So sort of what, what, um, what, what we need to do is we need to make sure the direction of line integration and the direction of the flux computation are compatible. And you just check that they're compatible through the right-hand rule. So if you sort of curl your hands, curl your um, 
fingers counterclockwise along the direction of C, you'll find that um, your thumb points up. So that means that as long as you follow this convention and then you just um, use this statement, then um, the signs will take care of themselves. And if you want a sort of more intuitive explanation of the negative sign, you can look up uh, Lenz's law, which essentially just explains a negative sign in a little bit more um, in sort of with words. But this is, I think, the most this is the most foolproof way to make sure you get the sign right by essentially orienting the line integration and the flux integration direction consistently. Okay. Anyways, but let's um let's let's go into a specific example of Faraday's law first. So this is the um fixed fields moving loop. So here E and B are stationary in time. And loop C is moving through space, moving in time. Or just, it's just moving. Well, by the way, before I talk about this, are there any questions about sort of my general uh, dis uh, description of Faraday's law? Okay, if not, we'll just talk about the fixed field moving loop case. So here it turns out that again, like I said here, there's a sort of force felt by the charges and it's due to the fact that the loop is moving and that um, causes a velocity for the charge and that causes a QB cross B force from the magnetic field and obviously whatever force in the electric field. So it turns out that in this case, when the fields are not changing in time, but the loop is moving, um, you can account for Faraday's law entirely through a QV cross B force. So here, um, Faraday's law, in this case, follows from QV cross B forces. So let's, let's do a sort of classic example to illustrate this point. So what we have is we have, uh, um, these are, this is essentially a conducting wire that's been bent like this. And then you sort of have a, another conducting metallic um, rod, which is um, somebody is forcing it to move at speed V to the right. And then there's always a, um, there's a B pointing into the page everywhere in this setup. So um, let's just suppose for simplicity that 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 the resist so that um you have a you sort of have a loop here, which current can flow through, and just suppose the resistance. Um, so we can just say that uh, the resistance of the rails is zero, and the resistance of the bars are so resistance are. So we're trying to find the current through the bar. So the first way to do this is to use Faraday's law. And recall that Faraday's law over here, back up here, this is, this is essentially this quantity is what's called an EMF. And you can sort of, this is sort of um, similar to voltage. If there's this sort of, this amount of EMF in a current loop, then um, the current is exactly the EMF divided by R. And in general, for a more complicated circuit, this essentially just takes the role of adding a battery to the circuit of, that, of this much voltage. So we're essentially trying to find the, the current here, which means we need to find the EMF E through Faraday's law. And then we can just divide the EMF E over R. Okay, so we're just gonna ignore signs for now. We're just gonna do the magnitudes, but um, let's say this has length L and let's say uh, this is currently at X. Then the magnetic flux is B times X times L. So this means that the, the change in magnetic flux is just B times V times L. 
because the derivative of x is b. So this means that the EMF, just, um, just ignoring the signs, is BVL. So the current is BVL over R. Does this computation make sense? Any questions about this computation using Faraday's law? Okay. So now let's let's prove the same result using um, just a Lorentz force law. So uh, suppose you have some charge. Let me use a different color. Suppose you have some charge Q inside the uh, inside the um, the rod. Now, obviously, the charge has sort of two components of velocity. It has it has this component of velocity. And then due to the current, it'll also have some other component of velocity in this direction. And this one is due to current. But uh, when we compute QB cross B, um, the, the, since B is pointing into the page, the force due to the component parallel to the rod will actually be perpendicular to the rod, the force. So it's not actually relevant for, for um, causing the current. So um, the component of QB cross B force parallel to the rod is actually just um, QVB because the other component is the whatever component of the velocity is parallel to the rod is not going to contribute to force parallel to the rod. So you have a QVB force um, on a charge Q inside, which means that the sort of effective potential difference between the bottom and the top of this rod is just um, VBL because what it means that if there's a force QVB on the charge, then the, then the amount of work on it, work done on it to go from the bottom to the top is QVBL, and you divide by Q to get this is the effective potential drop, effective potential drop, and then we're essentially done in the same way. Divide that by R, and this gives the um, this gives that uh, that's that I equals VBL over R is the current. So essentially what I'm illustrating here is that in the case where the, mag the magnetic and electric fields are fixed, but the loop in the loop in this case is the red loop is moving. Uh, Faraday's law, you can use Faraday's law and it's very useful, but it's, it's just a consequence of um, Lorentz force law. And you can prove it in general with a general mathematical loop and do some sort of vector calculus to prove that it's, that it follows from the QV cross V force in general. Um, I've given that as one of the problems. We're probably not going to go through it, but if you're sort of confident in your abilities with vector calculus, you can try to prove Faraday's law in this case in general. So you can actually prove Faraday's law from Lorentz force law using some some bashing. So if you're if you're confident, then you can try to do that. But um, if if you're not too good with vector calculus, that's also perfectly fine. Right. Okay. So any questions about this case of Faraday's law and anything I did so far? I'll just wait for like a minute so that people can ask the questions, whatever questions they have. And we'll get restarted at like 10, 17 or 10, 18.
Okay. So, um, no questions, and then we can get started with um, the rest. Okay. So now in the case, the case where the where the loop is fixed is actually, from a physics point of view, the most interesting case. Uh, in this case, the point is the magnetic field is changing in time. And the sort of fundamental physics point is that a changing magnetic field actually induces an electric field. But then what happens is that um, if you have a fixed loop, then there's no Vs, right? There's no V because the loop is fixed. So there's no Lorentz force on, the, on any charge Q. So the only force can come from QE. So what this means is that the entire force would essentially be E dot, the entire EMF would be coming from E dot DL because there's no QV cross V since the V is zero. And this is now equal to D phi DT. So there, there's a there's a glaring um, just from what physics we know so far there's a glaring issue with this statement. Can anybody tell me what the glaring issue with this statement is, based on the physics we understand so far? Yeah. So somebody said electric fields are conservative, so it doesn't make sense to say the line integral is non-zero. Exactly. Electric fields are conservative, so what that means is that a uh, line integral through a through a closed loop should be zero. So it turns out that um, that that electric fields conservative holds for electric fields that are generated solely from electric charge. So if you have charges, fixed charges, and they generate electric fields, that's called an, an electrostatic electric field, then it's conservative. But the point is that if you have electric fields generated from changing magnetic fields then those are non-conservative and they are non-conservative in exactly the following way. And so we can describe exactly what their line integral about any loop will be. So if I call this S, I'll just call it phi through, through S. Yeah, so, so this sort of breaks this rule and this describes that if electric field arises from a changing magnetic field rather than through charges, then it'll be non-conservative in the, exactly the following way. And just to point out, unlike the previous case of Faraday's law, which was a nice mathematical formulation, but it was just fo it followed from the Lorentz force law. This statement is entirely new physics because it's it's sort of stating the new physical effect that hey, if I have a magnetic field and I change it over time, then that actually produces a new electric field, which can't be explained through just charges. It's it's, it's new physics, um, new physics. Okay. Great. So those are sort of the two most important cases of Faraday's law, but obviously you can just use Faraday's law in general as well um, for finding the EMF through a loop due to a changing magnetic flux. Okay. So again, ask me any questions in the chat about Faraday's law if you have any, but I'll just get started talking about inductance in the meantime. Excuse me. So inductance is a concept useful for like for circuits generally, but um, it's sort of um, it's just talking about uh, for each for each um, sort of coil can we sort of uh, so okay so before I talk about that let's sort of talk about this idea of self induction because this will be a quite an important concept um, in general. So what this what this means is the following. Suppose I have a loop and I have a current I flowing through the loop. Then um, just due to, due to um, Biot-Savart law or just uh, the, the causation of magnetic fields, this will just cause a magnetic field in this case pointing downward. Um, obviously complicated magnetic field, not necessarily pointing exactly downward, but some sort of 
um, sort of loops and like a complicated magnetic field, but generally pointing downward. Okay, what this means is that uh, if now I is a function of T, then this magnetic field is actually changing in time. And therefore it actually has, it actually um, causes a flux change through this loop, which then therefore means that there's an EMF through the loop. And therefore um, you sort of have a differential, differential equation for I of T, if that makes sense. Now, obviously this is just a case where you have a, you have a single loop, but if the single loop is attached to a, to a whole, to a whole um, circuit, then what this means is that a changing I, a changing I in this sort of this sort of coil part of this loop, coil part of the circuit would actually cause a negative would cause a sort of effective voltage across that um, across that element. So in general, what that means is that if I sort of in, as part of a circuit, if I have some sort of coil of loop in a circuit, and there's a current I flowing through this coil and I is actually a function of time, then you can sort of see that um, in this coil, you'll have a negative effective voltage drop across this, or you'll have an effective voltage drop across this coil proportional to di dt, because that's what the change in magnetic flux will be proportional to. And um, you can sort of now treat this element as like a resistor, where if the resistor has current I flowing through it, it has a potential drop of IR. So this is essentially the idea of an inductor. It's this idea of self-induction where the current in the coil itself causes a magnetic field, which then causes a change in magnetic flux, which then causes an EMF. So to quantify this, we have to define the inductance of a coil. So if the, so um, if current I causes a magnetic flux phi, then L is defined to be phi over I. Maybe let me, let me write this a bit better. then the inductance is defined to be the flux divided by the current. So can somebody explain to me why this quantity is independent of the of what current you put through the coil? So I claim L is a purely geometric property of a, of a loop or a coil. So based on the equation here, it seems to depend on the current I. So can somebody explain to me why it doesn't, should end up, why it will not end up depending on the current I? Yeah, so somebody said the flux also changes with I. Can, can you just be a little bit more precise? Yes, flux depends on I, but can you explain me exactly why it shouldn't matter? Yeah, okay, so I, I guess people have basically got it. It's basically the, the idea is that the flux will be exactly the magnetic field generated by current I is exactly proportional to I. If you remember, like it goes like mu zero I over two pi R, things like that. So it's exactly proportional to I. So therefore the, the magnetic flux is exactly proportional to I. So when you divide out by I, it'll cancel and it'll be a purely geometric property of, of the setup is the point. Okay. So it depends pure, it depends just on the geometry. So if we assume that 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 that, that um, this is the statement of an of, of an inductor, then uh, you can sort of easily see that again in my circuit element over here. This is a circuit element. You can essentially say that 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 the voltage drop is negative l i dot, where i dot is the derivative of i. 
So unlike negative RI, so negative IR is a potential drop for, um, for a resistor. This is negative LI dot. Okay. And um, the energy, if, if I have a current I in a, in a coil, it causes some magnetic field and it turns out that magnetic fields store energy. So um, there's some energy stored in this coil in the magnetic fields if there's a current I flowing through an inductor. And it turns out that, that this energy, this potential energy stored as one half Li squared. Um, we'll, we'll not spend time proving it, but the way you prove it is you essentially just, uh, you start with the coil, you start with having zero um, current, and then you sort of slowly build up the current through it. And each time you add DI current, it's gonna face some resistance from the, from the, from the, from the negative Li dot um, potential. And then you can just compute the amount of work it takes you to, to, to bump up the current from zero to I, and that will be the amount of energy stored. So this is, so L is what's known as the self-inductance. And then um, if you have a current I in a coil, the energy is one half Li squared. And the potential drop is negative Li dot. Okay, but there's also something called mutual inductance. So what, what, what it means here is I have um, C1 and I have C2. And essentially what it says is now if I um, have a current I1 here and let's just say zero, zero current in C2, then the flux in two is essentially some mutual inductance times the I1. Now sort of the, um, the, the beautiful thing is that the mutual inductance is the same for one, two, and two, one. So it, what it means is if I have a current I2 through C2 and zero current through I1, then the flux through the first loop is just M times I2. So there's a symmetry between M, which is very non-trivial. It's not obvious at all, but um, it turns out to work. There's also mutual inductance. Okay, any questions about inductance, mutual inductance, energy stored? any of that. This is a pretty important concept. So let me know if there's any questions. I'll just wait for a couple minutes. Somebody asked me, it's a mutual inductance formula empirical. What do you mean by that? Like this, this is true mathematically as well. You can prove it. Like if I have, if I give you two loops and I put a current I1 through one and then you compute the entire magnetic field due to it, you can, you can do that using the Osabar law. And then you compute the flux through the second loop, which you can do mathematically you'll find that's proportional to I1. Proportionality to I1 is obvious. So actually, I, I think the definition of M is just, um, yeah, so I'm not sure what you mean by empirical formula. Can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure, is it like, um, somebody asking is the mutual inductance formula is experimental? I mean, it, it is true experimentally. For sure. I guess one thing I want to be clear, I guess one thing I should have been more clear about is that sort of these formulas for inductance, they're not more or less, they're not like physics formulas, they're more or less definitions. Because the fact that in this case that phi two is proportional to I one is actually completely obvious. Because if you double I one, the magnetic field from the first loop doubles, therefore the flux doubles, therefore um, phi two doubles. So phi two and I one are proportional and M is just defined to be the proportionality constant. M is literally just defined to be this obvious proportionality constant because the proportionality must be true. Alternatively, it must be true because of dimensional analysis. You can see that. 
Now, sort of the 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 um, I, maybe what you're asking about is the symmetry of mutual inductance. Why the mutual inductance of one two is the same as two one? Uh, that can be shown mathematically completely. It's with a big sort of vector calculus bash, but it's also true experimentally. These all everything every everything I say about about physics more or less should be true experimentally. So this is true experimentally as well. Okay, any other questions about inductance? Okay. Okay, if not, let's move on to finally to circuits and then we can get started with some of the problems. So here we'll need to recall um, a capacitor, but hopefully that's, that's fine for everybody. Okay, so let's just first start by doing RC circuits. So what you have here, just the simplest, um, simplest way to talk about this is you have a battery voltage V you have a capacitor, so Q and minus Q. You have a resistor. And then some current flows through here. OK. So first thing we can say is that um, I is equal to Q dot, right? Because Q is the, the, the charge on the on the plate, and if you have current I flowing, that's how much charge is being deposited on the plate. And now, if we just track voltages, we see that we have a. If we just go in a counterclockwise direction, we get plus V from the battery. Now, from the capacitor, we get a negative Q over C voltage drop because we're sort of going from the positive plate to the negative plate. And then we get an IR drop from the um, from the resistor, obviously. So therefore we have V equals Q over C plus IR. And then now if we were now replace, if we sort of take the derivative of this equation, we can see that um, we get that zero equals, so in particular, I dot is equal to negative one over RCI. So it's pretty easy to see that this implies that I of T is equal to I is zero, where tau is defined to be one over RC. So it's a decaying exponential from this differential equation. That's what happens in an RC circuit. Okay. Let's just do RL really quick. RL is almost identical. Uh, you essentially have a battery you have a resistor and now you have an inductor. So now in this case, you have V minus IR minus LI dot. So that's the potential drop in an inductor is zero. So what we get is that um, V is equal to LI dot plus RI. Um, so now, if, again, if you take the derivative, you'll get that I double dot plus R over L I is equal to zero. So this means that um, that uh, I dot of T is equal to some I dot of zero times E to the negative T over tau, or now tau is equal to L over R. Uh, did I make a mistake here? Did I reciprocate? Hmm. hmm. One sec. Yeah, okay. I think I made a mistake in the handout. And actually, this should be R over L. My apologies. 
the time constant is r over l and this is the the sort of i dot and then therefore you can see that essentially i of t will essentially be some sort of i1 plus i0 and you can plug this back in you can plug this solution back into this differential equation to find the relationship between i1 and i0 it's not just two free parameters but essentially this is the form of the solution again some sort of exponential decay in an rl circuit and finally, the most interesting case, RLC. Uh, here we have voltage V, capacitor C, resistor R, inductor L. So here we essentially get that V is equal to Q over C plus RI plus LI dot. And if we take the derivative, we essentially get that um, So can anybody tell me what this equation, what, what this equation looks like for I? Yeah, exactly. So somebody said it's SMA to a damping. That's exactly right. This is essentially simple harmonic motion. Uh, let me highlight this. So just these two terms, if you add them together, you get simple harmonic motion. And in particular, and the idea is that if the resistance is low, if the resistance is low and you just have more or less LC, this is uh, this is just a simple harmonic motion. And we'll, we can see that the, the frequency is omega equals one over root LC. So essentially have a one over root LC oscillation and if the resistance is small, it's just a basically a pure oscillation uh, with some damping due to the resistance. And that makes sense. Like uh, the um, why this makes sense is that capacitors and inductors fundamentally have no energy loss in them. Like we said, inductors can store energy. They store potential energy. Capacitors store potential energy. One half Q squared over C and one half Li squared. So both these objects store potential energy fully. So if we just have C and L, we should not expect there to be any, any energy loss. So a pure oscillation has no energy loss. And then if we add a resistance, which literally a resistance um, dissipates energy through heat, we expect there to be energy loss. And as we see, a damped oscillation has energy loss. So it, may, it makes sense that um, the resistance is a damping term and it damps uh, an oscillation. Okay, any questions about RC, L, about LRC circuits, anything I did? RC, RL, RLC. I'll just wait for a couple of minutes for any questions. And then um, we can start doing some of the problems. How somebody asks, how is V equals L D I D T for an inductor? Okay, let me actually spell out in it, spell it out in a bit more detail. So um the what an inductor is, the definition of inductance is that in a coil, the flux through the coil is L I. So what that means is that if I have a loop and I push a current I through it, and that generates a magnetic field, and the flux due to that magnetic field is L times I. L is a proportionality constant. Then um, the, the magnetic flux change. So the EMF, which is essentially V is equal to this negative D phi DT, which is then therefore just equal to negative L D I D T. So just as a consequence of Faraday's law. That's why this works. Okay.
Okay. Cool. Okay, let's get started on the problems. So problem one is his self-excited dynamo. So just look at problem one from the handout. The pictures will be very important. So what a self-excited dynamo essentially is that what we're doing is we're sort of, um, we have a sort of a conductor and suppose there's a little bit of current in this conductor, then similar to self-inductance that current will cause a magnetic field. But then therefore uh, driving, driving this conductor through that magnetic field will have a changing magnetic flux somehow. And then therefore uh, that will cause uh, EMF, which will cause a current to flow. So what this, what, what essentially what we're saying is that you, um, uh, as you drive a conductor to the magnetic field, it causes an EMF in the conductor, which then causes a current, and that and that current is the thing causing a magnetic field. So it's sort of like you have a set a sort of a current which is causing a magnetic field, and then the sort of change in the flux of the magnetic field is also causing the current in the first place. That's what it means by self-excited dynamo. So the question is, which of these two pictures can be a self-excited dynamo? Um, basically, the point is for one of them, uh, if you keep increasing the current, that actually makes the EMF um, sort of in the direction of the current. So the EMF will then support the current. So if I start increasing the current, the EMF will start supporting the current, and therefore the thing will keep going. Whereas in the other picture, if I start adding some current, the EMF will be against the current. So it'll actually be like, if I try to add current, this thing will sort of stop me and will um, not want to add more current. So it'll actually not work. So one of the, one of the cases will, so will sort of, as you add current, will make the current bigger. And one of them, as you add current, will make the current smaller. And we're trying to find the one for which adding current makes the current bigger. OK, so we can actually just do this. Um, so the way we do this is we essentially just imagine flowing a current I through the system and then just seeing whether does this setup cause the current I to increase or does it cause the current I to decrease? That's the only question that we have to ask. Let's just do that. So let's just um, think about that. Okay. So imagine, imagine a current I. What we'll do is we'll imagine a current I. Let me try to draw a schematic of this. It will be a bit hard, but. Um. So you, you should you should you should look at the picture in the in the handout, but this is just to sort of explain the direction. We'll say that, that the current is always flowing in this direction. Um, so counterclockwise. Okay. And we're sort of driving this in this direction. Yeah, but again, look at the picture in the handout. So the idea is that um, if we have this current I flowing, then if you think about it, if you follow its track uh, through, the, through the circuit, it eventually has to go from the edge of the disc back to the center of the handle if you want to make a closed loop. So in this picture, in this terrible picture, the current has to flow like um, and then from here it has to go back through the disk and back up through the rod. 
Okay. So the point now is that what's going to happen is that this current that's flowing on the disk from the edge of the disk to the center is um, also having a tangential velocity. And these sort of these two loops of, um, of I are going to be causing a magnetic field that's pointing um, up. So uh, we'll actually have a magnetic field. pointing up and that's just due to the right hand rule. If you think about what these two circular circular loops of magnetic field they'll form, they'll be pointing an upward pointing magnetic field. And then therefore, um, if I now look at my, um, my disc and what I had is I had current flowing from uh, here to there. but this whole thing is rotating at the same time. Uh, you'll see that each little charge here also has a tangential velocity, V. And there's a magnetic field pointing upward. So the force actually, the QV cross V force, if I have a positive Q, the QV cross V force is actually pointing in this direction. The force, the, 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 the sort of component of the force parallel to I. So what this is saying now is that the, the QV cross V force on the, on the current due to the magnetic field caused by the circuit is opposed to the current. So what this means is that if I increase the current, then, then, then driving the conductor, so causing this V is actually gonna cause a QV cross V force, which is against my current. And therefore the first, the first drawing where the omega is in the direction I showed is actually not gonna work because having a current causes the force, causes the, um, causes the forces on the charge to be opposed to the direction of the current, which means that it's sort of going in the wrong direction. But if I simply switch the direction of omega, which is the difference between, between the two pictures, the force, the current direction stay all the same, but the force on the charges in the current will now immediately um, switch directions. So therefore in that case, actually increasing the current and then it having the, um, the driving omega increasing the current actually will increase the force on the particles in that direction. So therefore, um, therefore the answer is the second one. Okay, any questions about this problem? This is a bit of an involved problem, but any questions about it? This is known as a self-excited dynamo. Okay, and so no questions about this one. If that's the case, I'll move on to problem two. This is Yusufo 2009 A1. And again, I would encourage you to go to the handout and for the problem statement. Okay, so I'll just give everybody a minute to read the problem because it's a bit long and then we'll get started.
Somebody said if you change in the first problem, if you change the direction of the current, then wouldn't the first option work? Actually, no. And it shouldn't, right? Because this is sort of a fundamental property and it shouldn't depend on what direction of current we um, choose. And the reason is that if I change the direction of the current, the magnetic field will also change direction. So it doesn't work. Yeah. Cool. Yep. This is actually very fundamental. Um, all, all the directions work out and uh, yeah, it's quite nice. Okay, so hopefully everybody's had some time to read to read uh, the statement of problem A, useful A1. So let me just, uh, let me um, go through the solution. So the first part of the problem is is sort of the um, what's going on here is that this is this object is a solenoid, and um, we're just asked to find the magnetic field inside a solenoid. So we can just cite some formulas, but just um, for sake of uh, for sake of uh, um, teaching, let's just go through the derivation again. So this is my solenoid, and then we have a current, sort of I flowing along the edge of the solenoid. And we know from solenoids that the magnetic field inside will be pointing uh, will be pointing upwards. Now, how do we compute it? Well, well, well and we know it's zero outside, zero outside. The way we compute it is by taking this sort of, um, we use Ampere's law and take this Amperean loop with height h. Then um, the uh, sorry, my bad. So Ampere's law states that the integral of b dot dl is equal to the um, mu zero times the current through the loop. So bh is the integral of b dot dl, and the current through the loop, if you think about it, is i times h over l, because the current i is distributed over the entire length l, so it's i h over l. Uh, mu naught. So B is just mu naught I over L. That's the answer to part A. Just simple solenoid calculation. So 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 um now they're sort of asking about inductance. This um this magnetic field will cause an EMF to develop, right? So uh, the question is, what is that EMF? So we have a flux, the magnetic flux, which is equal to B times pi R squared, where this other thing has radius R. So therefore, um, the EMF is equal to negative d phi dt equal to negative pi r squared so that's 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 all we have for um for part part b just faraday's law Right, and then part C. Part what is part C saying now? Well, um, what it's saying is that there's also a resistance in this in this in as we drive this current through this solenoid because it has a thickness thickness d, and it's a resistive material. So we also have F's, um, the EMF is equal to I R, <laughs> and essentially what we're doing here is we're essentially just saying that this thing is an R L circuit, because it has a resistance due to its resistivity and it has a um, inductance, which we calculated here. And we're just saying both are equal to the EMF and that essentially amounts to, um, does, does, that, does that make sense? So this is essentially just an RL circuit. It's essentially just a, um, 
it's just a RL circuit with zero external voltage. So if we go back to the RL circuit with zero external voltage, we just get Li dot plus Ri is zero. And that's exactly what we get here. This is negative Li dot, more or less. And this is equal to IR. So we'll essentially end up getting an RL circuit. But we have to compute the resistance now. And if you remember the formula for resistance, the formula for resistance is rho L over A, where L is the length of the resistor and A is the cross-sectional area. And in this case, that's just rho times 2 pi R over L D. Um, the reason for that is that, um, again, the 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 way I the way I remember how a how a um, how resistivity works is that if I have a resistor which is let's say let's say I have a resistor which is a pure cylinder and it has length l and cross sectional area a and then the resistance is rho l over a so in this case it has thickness d and the current is flowing in that direction. So the cross-sectional area is just L times D that it's flowing through. It's flowing through a cross-sectional area of L times D. And then the um, entire length of the resistor is 2 pi R. So that's my resistance. So therefore, I have that epsilon is equal to rho times 2 pi R over L D times I, the EMF. So now in part D, I can just set these two to be equal. Rho times 2 pi r over LDI plus pi r squared It's essentially just an RL circuit. And then I'm not going to go through it, but you can just, with this differential equation, you can easily find I of t. It'll be a decaying exponential. It'll be I of 0 times e to the negative t over tau, where tau is some ratio of two of these guys. Uh, you can calculate that out. And it essentially, it's just a decaying exponential. So the point of this problem was that it was just secretly just an RL circuit. Okay, any questions about this one? We'll just give it a couple minutes. Yeah, so the L here is essentially just R's pi R squared mu zero L. Exactly, P mu zero over L. Exactly. Well, um, hold on. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because if we go back here, we'll see that essentially we can say this is now mu zero pi R squared over L times I. And the definition of inductance was phi equals Li. So we saw here explicitly that, 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 that the, um, the flux is just some constant times i, and that constant is the inductance. So yeah, exactly. Any other questions about this one? OK. If not, let's move on to problem three. This is mutual inductance of two solenoids. So we essentially have um, an outer solenoid with 2A2 and a much smaller inner solenoid of width 2A1. And the lengths are B1, B2, and here we have N1 turns and N2 turns. 
So you should imagine this as like a, what I've drawn is essentially like a cross section of a cylinder. And there's a bunch of sort of coils of wire coiled up. So the question is, what is the mutual inductance of these two? So again, recall for mutual inductance, what that means is that I have to be sending a, a current I through one of them, a current zero through the other one, and find the flux through the zero current one due to the current flowing in the other one, and then divide those, find the factor. So, okay, so here's a question for the chat. If I flow a current I through the inner solenoid, and then I try to compute the flux through the outer solenoid, would you be able to do that? If I flow a current I through the inner solenoid, then how would you compute the flux um, in the outer solenoid? Can somebody tell me how you would do that? And again, you can look at the handout for a clearer picture. The handout has a bunch of dots instead of lines. And what those dots mean is essentially like any two dots that are vertically on top of each other are essentially the cross sections of a loop going through the page. So how would you compute the flux due to the, um, if I flow current I through the inner loop in the outer solenoid? Can you even mathematically, can you even do it? Is it even feasible? So I'll just say the answer is that it's not feasible. And the reason is that um, if you think about it, then uh, the actually the, the, the field of the solenoid outside the solenoid, sort of the actual field of a solenoid um, looks something like uh, it's sort of straight inside, but then it sort of starts looping out outside. And it's actually not, um, it's not completely just straight all the way. It can't be. So if we send a current I through the inner solenoid, we'll have to account for all this weirdness of the magnetic field of the solenoid just outside of um, the inner part. And that would be completely infeasible to do. But if you send a current I through the outer one and we find the flux of the inner one, that's fine because the inner one is fully in the region where the magnetic field of a solenoid is simple. So even though theoretically we should be able to do it by sending current I through N1 through the first one and computing all the magnetic flux, it's very infeasible to do just because we'll have to account for all the fringe fields and all the complexity of the field, but not in the other case. So anyway, so I'll send current I through I2 through a big solenoid. So the magnetic field that causes, um, this is just another um, classic solenoid calculation will be uh, and therefore the flux in the inner solenoid is therefore uh, N1 times pi A1 squared. And the reason the N1 is there is if you think about it, it's like N sort of coils. So the flux um, counts N times, if you think about what that means, since the coils coil about N times. So this is the flux and therefore the mutual inductance is just, so it's just mu zero pi A1 squared N1 N2 over B2. Okay, so here's a question for everybody. Uh, I told you that mutual inductance is symmetric, right? So how come this formula is asymmetric in if I swap one and two, it's sort of, sort of an A1 squared and a B2, but there's no A2 squared and no B1. So how is this, how can mutual inductance be symmetric if the formula I just wrote down here is non-symmetric?
Okay, again, the reasons, as I essentially just said, the reason before is that, um, yeah, there's asymmetry because one of them ones is a lot smaller than the other one, and one of them is inside. So there, there's no reason to expect symmetry in the formula. Like I said, the, the what the symmetry means that if I now sign a current I1 through the inner solenoid and find the flux to the larger one, then the same ratio should appear. But it's not going to be very simple to calculate. It'll be very, very hard to calculate because you have to find the general magnetic field to a solenoid, not just the simple constant one that's inside it, but the magnetic field everywhere. OK, cool. So any questions about this one? Okay, if not, we'll get started with problem four. So what we have here is a very interesting setup. This is not really drawn to scale, but whatever. So I have three loops, but the inner and the outer ones are not closed. They're just, um, incomplete loops with two nodes where you can sort of measure the voltage across. And the radii are R, 2R, and 4R. And I sort of have a, a time varying current flowing through the middle one. OK? And at certain point in time, the voltage reading on the inner loop is V0. So the volts, if I put a voltmeter across the two nodes of the inner loop, I get V0. So what is voltage reading on the outer loop? So the idea here is that the reason there's a voltage is because of mutual inductance. So like let, let M of R be mutual inductance of a ring of radius R and a ring of radius 2R. So I have two rings, just concentric, and let M R be their mutual inductance. Then if I let this be V0 and let this be V1, Then I, then I literally have V0 is equal to M and the reason is that is because M of R is the mutual inductance between the inner and the middle loop and M of 2R is the mutual inductance between the middle and outer loop. And then since the mutual inductance is just the ratio of the flux to the current, if you just apply Faraday's law in the same way as before, you get these two relations for the voltages. So therefore, V1 over V0 is just M of 2R over M of R. And now you can sort of see through dimensional analysis that MR, it has to be proportional to R. Um, can, anybody, can anybody see why that must be true? Give an argument, or not dimensional analysis, but sort of by scaling argument. So, like um, the magnetic field in general will be proportional to uh, one over R everywhere. That's sort of the order of the magnetic field. The areas are proportional to R squared, so the flux is proportional to R, and the mutual inductance, which is essentially proportional to the flux, is therefore proportional to R. So mutual inductance is proportional to R, so this ratio is just two. So therefore V1 is two V0. Now, one thing I wanna point out here is that the sort of nat, if you don't know about mutual inductance beforehand, you'll say, okay, I have a flux, I have a current I of T through the middle loop. And let me find, let me compute the, electric, the magnetic field everywhere and find the flux of the inner loop and the outer loop using, using um, just Bios of our law 
and then I'll use Faraday's law directly. Well, that's actually very hard. And the way we sort of got around this is we use the symmetry of mutual inductance in a very concrete way. Like um, in this equation over here, uh, the, the loop with the current passing through it is the outer loop in the R to R dichotomy. We have a current, in this case, current is flowing through the middle loop and it's causing a voltage in the, in the inner loop. And in the other case, you have a current flowing through the middle loop and that causes a voltage in the outer loop. So if we didn't have symmetry of mutual inductance, we'll actually have two M of R's. One for uh, a current through radius R causes a current in radius two R, or sorry, causes a voltage in radius two R and the other one, which is of a current in radius two R that causes a voltage in radius R. And those two would be separate M1 and M2 of R. And then we would just get maybe like M1 of or two R over M2 of R and we won't be able to say anything. But since mutual inductance is symmetric, those two quantities are the same and therefore this proof is able to work. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you couldn't have done this directly with Faraday's law. You need to use the symmetry of mutual inductance for this problem. Anyways, any questions about this? Yes, there's no self-inductance because the inner and outer loops are open. Exactly, that's why they're open. Otherwise, the current, there would be a current through those and those would call self-inductance and the, the system would be too complex to analyze. But yeah, since they're, since they're open, there's no current through them, but there's just a voltage induced across them. Okay, let's do problem eight. It, it, it demonstrates some very nice um, properties of inductors. And then we'll, uh, we'll end after that. So we have here is we have a circuit with a battery. And a switch. Inductor, inductor, and again, resistor, resistor. And we're viewing these resistors as bulbs, but that's not too important for what we're doing right now. So first the switch S is closed for a very long time. So when the switch is closed for a very long time, means the current is flowing through everything. And what that means is that uh, what happens to an LR circuit after it flows for after it's flowed for a very long time? Well, what happens is that uh, after a very long time, the current becomes a steady state. And what that means is that steady state means there's no potential difference across the inductors. Does that make sense? After a long time, there's no, there's no um, current across, there's no, um, sorry, there's no voltage difference across the inductors because there's no change in current after a long time. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the circuit then in that case just looks like Uh, drawing skills are really bad. So it just looks like this. And in this case, you can see that if the V is this and the currents through all of these are just V over, well, what is it? It's just V over R, right? There's just a current V over R through all of them. 
Well, actually, it would be pointing the other way. And we technically have inductors here, but there, nobody cares about them when the switch is closed for a long time. But it'll be important. So what, what we'll see is that the, the current through the inductors is I and 2I, just by Kirchhoff's laws. OK, now the question is, right when the switch is opened, what happens? So the key property of inductors that we use here is that if you instantaneously change something, the inductors will not, for for um, just right when the switch is uh, opened, in a regular circuit, like if there's no inductors here, and if right when I open the switch, all the currents would go to zero immediately because there's no longer any voltage difference across, and they would immediately all go to zero. But an inductor, since an inductor, um, an inductor essentially resists change in current. If you try to change the current in it, it causes a uh, voltage that's against that. So right when the switch is open, the inductors actually will not immediately change their, uh, their, uh, their value. What will happen is that sort of the inductors and the resistors will then do a, will do a decay, will do an LR circuit decay, and they'll decay away the current. So right when the switch is opened, the inductors will maintain their same current values. So like in this case, essentially, we'll see that the inductor is still holding 2i and i of current. So what that means is that then this resistor by Kirchhoff's law would have i. This resistor would have i. And this resistor would have 2i. So what this means is that um, the brightness of a bulb is proportional to its current squared. So what this means is that right when you open the switch, the the right the rightmost two bulbs will maintain their same brightness, and the leftmost bulb will will quadruple in brightness. Okay, so um, but, but let me just do a little bit of discussion more on why we can assume right when we open the switch, the uh, the inductor maintains its uh, value. The reason is that so imagine the case where there's no inductor. So you just have a, a regular circuit with resistors and a battery, and you open the switch, then the the current will immediately stop. It won't actually immediately stop, but it will stop. And the um, sort of the uh, the time for stopping is proportional to the length of the circuit over the speed of light. This is because electrical information travels at the speed of light. So the, the time for stopping in just a regular no inductor circuit is the length of circuit over speed of light, which for all practical purposes is really, really small. But the time of decay for LR circuit, for LR circuit, is the time constant, which we saw all the way at the top, the time constant for an LR circuit is R over L. And R over L is actually way, way, way bigger than the length of the circuit over the speed of light. So essentially what we're saying is that, that yes, eventually when you open the switch, the inductors will eventually decay all their, all their current, but it'll takes about R over L time. So right when we open the, the essentially the, um, the, resistors, the resistors all immediately notice that the switch is opened, but the inductors still maintain their same current for some time. So sort of the, 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 the vast difference in orders of magnitude of these two numbers explains why we can do that. Can you explain why it's 2i for the first resistor? Well, um, if we have a current i through the inductor and a current 2i through the second inductor, then uh, since the switch is open, we can, treat, we, can treat, we can treat this entire part of the circuit as essentially dead. So only this part matters. So if we have i and 2i through the top two edges, then it's just a simple consequence of Kirchhoff's laws. And actually, OK, I messed up the direction. Uh, I messed up the direction. It should be i pointing downwards, 2i pointing downwards, just by Kirchhoff's law. Because if you look at this node right here, in order for the current inflow and outflow to be the same on that node. OK. So that's all for today, but I guess I'll just stick around for a couple more minutes to see if anybody has any questions.
Why is the brightness of all proportional to I squared? Because the power dissipated in a, in a resistor is I squared R. And brightness is a proportional to power. Brightness of anything is proportional to the power emitted. And the power emitted is I squared R. So therefore it's I squared. Also, let me stop the recording real quick. <laughs>